Hi there, let's talk sports fans. Thanks for tuning in to our second episode of this Ask the X Pro. And I'm joined by my co host, Jonathan Bruceman. Thanks for coming in today again for another chat. Absolutely. Enjoyed uh, the first time. It's going to make a fun time for the second time around. Yeah, it's we, as I was saying to you before we come on, they seem quite good reaction to it and um i'm sure it'll only get better as we um get more used to one another oh absolutely um as you was telling me beforehand you had a good week coaching uh feel our listeners in on how your week went with your team yeah, absolutely. Uh, in my program, we had our younger uh, teams playing, our uh, middle school 14-year-old team and our 12U uh, youth team uh, playing this week. And uh, the 12U group, brand new to the organization, uh, got the chance to compete for the second term this weekend. Uh, still learning the, uh, the, the ways as far as the, the level that we're playing at with that group. Uh, but they're competing very well. They're competing and they're learning. And that's, that's the key for that age is making sure they learn the game as much as possible. Our middle school 14U team, our younger 14U team got to compete this weekend. Uh, out of 17 teams, they were able to finish uh, tied for third place, uh, made it to these semifinals. Before we ran out of gas, uh, you know, depth wise was kind of a little tough on us, got a little bit hot down here in Texas uh, this weekend. So, but a very, uh, very encouraging for that group. It was their second tournament as well uh, in our program and very uh, still learning that uh, level of competition for them, uh, but they were able to compete and, and play really well all weekend. So very proud of both of our uh, teams and how they were able to do this week. Yeah, I mean, and congrats to them. And I also find uh, when you're just talking about developing players, it's sometimes better if you have some success, but then maybe have that fall because my mantra is always, you learn more from uh, defeat than you do a victory. Oh, absolutely. And that's something I preached to the girls to, uh, this weekend was that, hey, let's learn learn as much as we can during those uh, those tough games. And, and as long as you're competing, especially at this age, like being young, as long as you're competing, uh, you're, you're getting better. And that's what that, that's what matters most for, for those girls right now. Yeah, I agree. And um, talking of getting better, before we start, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Freddie Sanderfall, who is an ex-professional, but now he's in the mental health uh, section and he's written a book, Mentally Strong, which is seven steps becoming your best version of yourself. And um, I thank him for partnering up with us. And also it's something what I preach, obviously, especially with the last year we've had there's mental changes. And as he said, when I interviewed him, he noticed when he was in the locker room, you've got these strong guys, but it's always mentally drawing. So, and I applaud him for speaking out on that. Um, now, if we get on to the action this week, Jonathan, um, We've got a few topics to discuss, but what's your um, just general view of now we've had a bit more of action of what's going on in the league as a whole? I'm excited for what the season's kind of looking like. It's going to be very competitive uh, from, from early on still entering week three of the season. Uh, you're going to see uh, some teams at the top of the of divisions battling it out. We're seeing right now in the uh, in both the AL and the NL East uh, with Braves and Phillies going back and forth this weekend. Uh, their second series, you're seeing it with the Yankees and Rays and Red Sox and Orioles all kind of competing in the NL, in the AL East. Uh, you have the out West right now with uh, with the Dodgers and Padres uh, going back and forth uh, in uh, the National League West. Uh, American League West still trying to figure out some things. So it's exciting to see early on you got some competition uh, amongst the top, but at the same time, the teams that are competing for wild card spots going to be uh, once you get into August and September, uh, you're going to see a lot of these uh, these divisions really trying to battle it out, and it's going to be exciting. It's going to be fun. Uh, and like I said, we talked about last week, 
uh, the, the the key factor of everything that we're having with the season is just getting people back into the stands. And that makes it even more exciting and, and, and worth watching uh, this year in 2021. Yeah, I agree. And um, I guess the first place to start is your Atlanta Braves. Um, I feel like um, they've had some good, some bad, but I still feel like the best is it to come from them. I think from top to bottom, they have one of the better rosters. But for some reason, although they do get their credit, I almost feel like they slept on a little. Would you agree? Absolutely. When you have uh, uh, the New York Mets making big splashes in this offseason, you have the Philadelphia Phillies with the star power they have on that roster, you're gonna you're, you're gonna be uh, kind of under the radar. And the Atlanta Braves are usually every year. Uh, for, you could probably go back for the last 20, 30 years. The Atlanta Braves have usually always been under the radar team uh, in the National League and even in Major League Baseball. Uh, I believe, and you know, for early on this year, you're probably gonna talk about hear conversations about Ronald Acuna being the MVP candidate this year. He has been on a tear uh, early on these first two weeks, batting over 380. Uh, he was putting on a show this weekend against the Phillies, uh, beating out a ground ball as first at back, beating out a ground ball at shortstop. And it was just clear cut, uh, you know, infield hit. And you're just kind of seeing a different mindset of Ronald Acuna this year for the Atlanta Braves. And that was something that we didn't see with him the previous two years. Uh, this being his fourth year in the big leagues, uh, third uh, year as a full time big leaguer. He, he is in a mindset that we've never seen him before. And you put him alongside with the uh, reigning MVP, Freddie Freeman, uh, the Braves have. It's a young roster with some veterans uh, mixed in. And the rotation, you talk about young guys with Max Reed, Ian Anderson, uh, Mike Soroka, when he comes back healthy from his Achilles, you have some power arms. You have some strong arms in that rotation that can compete with the likes of the Phillies in the division. And they also competed with the Dodgers in the, uh, in the postseason, had that 3-1 series lead. Uh, in the, in October in the NLCS, so you have some you have some firepower. You have the ability to compete at the at the top uh, with the Dodgers and potentially with the Padres in the National League. So it's going to be exciting to see as long as they continue to stay healthy and they continue to find the offensive rhythm. And it's a power hitting team uh, that can spray the ball around when it needed to. So as long as they're hitting that uh, hitting that long ball, they, you know, I don't see a lot of teams being able to match them as they get hot throughout the summer. Yeah, I agree. And the interest in how this plays out and another team, what you mentioned in the Phillies, feel like they were slept on a bit. Everyone was talking about the Mets, but they almost seem to be doing what people thought the Mets were going to do um, this offseason. And they just seem more together as a unit and have surprised some people already this early in the season. Yeah, when you talk about a deep roster, that's what the Phillies have as well. We, you know, we talk, uh, comparing them to the Atlanta Braves and what the roster looks like there. The, the Phillies have an offense that can match with Bryce Harper leading the way with Reese Hoskins. You have some speed with uh, with Andrew McCutcheon, D.D. Gregorius, uh, Gene Zagura. So again, more so on the leadership side, when we talk about the Braves with the youth, the Phillies have the leadership side, a lot of veterans on that line, uh, on that lineup card with some young guys mixed in with uh, John Bohm as well. Uh, they're getting the opportunities to kind of see some of these young guys, but you also have uh, one of the best pitchers in all of baseball, uh, Aaron Nola, paired him with Zach Wheeler. They're, they're primed to make a, a run. I think Philadelphia uh, ownership, Philadelphia front office, a little tired of seeing the Braves over the last few years take control of the division. And it's supposed to be what they're supposed to be doing. They're, you know, the way they constructed that, uh, that roster, they're supposed to be competing. And there's been kind of a letdown the last couple of years, especially when you had the big Bryce Harper signing. They're expecting themselves to be competing for not only a division title, but also for a National League uh, pennant. And they've been disappointing. Uh, so you're trying, you're trying to see some things come around a little bit more with that group. Uh, hopefully, you know, what the, they want to see from Joe Girardi is be a little bit more of that leadership role that they've been expecting. You know, he had some mix-ups in, in Atlanta uh, with uh, Girardi and uh, his decision-making, and that's kind of bit the Phillies uh, uh, quite a bit over the last few years when they had Gabe Kapler as the manager. 
So they're trying to find a way to get out of that little closet that they've been in, um, in the front office and the coaching staff, with such a talented team that you, you don't want to be that let down group. And that's kind of what Philadelphia has, but there's so much talent on that team. There's so much uh, to be able to compete. They talk about a team as a sleeper team for the national league. The Phillies could be one just because of what they have on that roster. Yeah, I agree. And, um, Another side, what we mentioned is the Mets. It almost seems like I talked on so many of my shows about uh, they seem to be the team what's making so much noise. And yes, you can argue they have one of the best rosters on paper, but this isn't a fantasy baseball and the game isn't played on paper. And it almost seems like they put this super roster together, but I feel like I always thought it'd take time to gel, but to me, it also seems like maybe the manager doesn't know. He has all these toys and he almost has too many. He don't know how to use them, if that makes sense. It, it is an embarrassment of riches and what that group uh, has in New York, uh, in Queens. Uh, Francisco Lindor, who you know is going to be battling and has been competing and, and you know, showing that he. He's probably one of the best players in the National League uh, for the for the Mets. Uh, the pitching staff uh, with uh, Jacob Degrom, it, it's it's mind boggling how when the, how good Jacob Degrom is, and they can't score for him, and it's just it's so bizarre when you have an ace uh, like that. Your team usually is you score the most runs for that ace because you know you're going to get a dominant game. You score some runs, and it's, it's ball game. And the Mets cannot do that with Jacob DeGrom. And it's just so weird to see when you watch guys that, like Aaron Nola for the Phillies. You see Garrett Cole for the Yankees, uh, all these all these aces, and they're getting run support like none other. But Jacob DeGrom, they, they do not score over the last two, maybe three years, I think is what it was, that their run support for Jacob DeGrom is not existent. And it's just bizarre how, how bad it can be and how dominant he still is. Uh, as a um, as an ace for that staff, and they can't help them. And it's I, I, it's it's nobody in baseball can really figure it out what's going on. But that team is still stacked. They're going to figure it out. Uh, is the manager a little bit over his head with that group? Who's to say at this point? I mean, it is New York, and New York, you know, you don't win in New York immediately. You don't win at all, and you're gone. Uh, so, that it, but at the same time, they're 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 figuring things out. It's going to take time with with a all star studded cast of players. Uh, with Lindor and with Alonzo Conforto and the starting rotation that you have, it, it's it's going to be scary once they do figure it out that it's going to be very tough to beat them later on in, in the uh, dog days of summer. Yeah, it's funny. I agree with you about the drum. It's the games he plays is meant to be that sort of banker win. You play him, he sort of shuts the side out and then the hitting supports him, but it's almost like he's obviously the quarterback of the team, but the guys won't play for him. And it just seems like, obviously, we had it on Saturday, but there's just the history of they just failed to show up for him. And you do wonder how long it'll be before he starts asking questions about that. Well, like I said, when you have your ace uh, on the mound you feel the confidence that, Hey, we're going to, this is going to be a good game. Let's go play our game offensively. Let's go play some good defense and we're going to win the ball game. And you always, again, as I said, you see typically the teams score a lot more runs when they're ace on the mound. And then you have the moments too. And it, it, there's a history of it with other teams in the past. And there's, this is not the first time of thing that, uh, that the Mets are going through with Jacob DeGrom. You have teams where they get a little bit of a law and they're just like, well, we know he's going to go do his job. Uh, and shut down the other team. We don't necessarily have to score three, four, five, six runs a game uh, when he's on the mound. And you kind of just get yourself in a lull in that in, in the roster and, uh, or in the game at that time. And it just makes it a little bit harder for the for the defense and for the starting pitcher that he has to almost at sometimes be perfect. And the grommet uh, is having to be perfect to win ball games. And even when he is perfect, they still don't win ball games. So it's one of those things, as you said, that maybe he's got to figure out, or maybe the, the manager's got to figure it out, or uh, the, the front office has to kind of figure out why this is going on and why this is happening to, to him. Uh, he's doing his job, and that's all you can ask for is your ace to go do your job, uh, do his job, shut down the team, 
keep it within a one run ball game or, you know, get only allowing one run a ball game at that. And, you know, the other rest of the guys on the, on the, uh, on the lineup, they're not doing their job for them. And it's just, like I said, it's, it's the bizarre uh, side of how baseball works sometimes. Yeah, it is. And um, it'll certainly be interesting how this dynamic plays out. Um, Moving across the E to the Yankees, um, they've had, an interesting week, as they always seem to. Um, we spoke last week about, will the Mets keep them off the back pages? But it just seems like no matter what they do, they can't. Um, they've had a on and off week on the field, and then they've also had the judge injury, which we spoke about that last week. How long can he stay fit? Well, the answer for that was not long. I mean, they're underplaying it, and I know he's back on the field, but I just feel like we ain't seen the last of this injury. Yeah, I'm not necessarily uh, reading into Aaron Judge's injury. I don't necessarily buy into, you know, oh, I was taking too many swings between games or before games and after games uh, to work on certain things. Uh, th that's just the genetic side of being 6'8", 270, which is what Aaron, uh, Aaron Judge is, or 6'7", uh, 270. Uh, you don't see baseball players that size, and it's just the, the genetics, you know, biometrics of how the body works and, you know, his body's going to break down even at 20 in his mid 20s at 24, 25, 26. I believe is what Aaron Judge is uh, age wise. You, your body does only can do so much at a certain size in, in baseball and guys who are bigger guys like that are very tall. They end up having oblique injuries. And that's what you know, Aaron Judge kind of saying he tweaked his side or, um, you know, taking a lot of swings. Uh, in practice, they're going to have to, you know, be mindful of how many swings he takes before games and after games. Uh, to make sure that he stays healthy. Um, I don't like the response of, well, if I miss two games here in, in, uh, in a month and just sort of for maintenance, uh, I should be fine going to the season. That's not how baseball works. It can work in basketball, and it's kind of worth getting it up in the NBA where you have these maintenance days, but in baseball, it's about timing. If you're missing a couple of days, even the two days of off, your timing can be thrown off as well. So I don't necessarily agree with what Aaron uh, Judge was talking about, uh, you know, taking a couple of days off here and there and only playing 150 out of 162 games. That's all great. But what if your team goes three and seven out of those 10 games that you just missed? Uh, then you're putting yourself in a position where you may not win the division in those games where you might be needed. Uh, that's going to be the storyline. It's going to be can the Yankees stay healthy? We talked about that last week, as I said, and. Uh, judges, and this is, like I said, this isn't going to be the first time he's going to miss time. He's probably going to be on the IL at some point in the future this season, just because that's his history. And if the Yankees can survive that, they'll be uh, in good contention. But history has shown that it comes back and haunt them uh, as the season progresses. Yeah, I'd rate it certainly be interested. I mean, that's um, managing. Stanton's game time as well, and with the injuries of other players that ain't got deep enough roster to manage both of their game time, so it'll be interesting how that um, plays out. But they added a piece this week in the signing of Odor, which I actually think it's a, it seems to some people that it's a small move, but I think it could help a lot because if you look at it deep into his career, he has had times when he's got reasonably hot and I think he could help. He's got some versatility and also it's a low risk move because they didn't give up too much and Texas are paying most of Romani over the next, I believe, two years. Yeah, it's a very typical Yankees uh, move where you find a guy who's needing a new uh, scene, a new team. Uh, they convince the team, we'll take him off your hands if you pay the, the rest of the salary, if you pay the majority of the salary or what it is. It's a very Yankee move, uh, low risk, high reward. If, if Odor can figure out uh, his... His playing uh, of how he was back in, I think it was 2016, 2017, uh, when he was, you know, 
a high level prospect and play, performing really well for the Rangers during that time frame. And then something just, you know, hit him and he has not been the same ball player since. So a new scene, a new team, a new city can be very beneficial for him to just kind of reset. And you see a lot of that happen at times where you just, you feel out of place anymore. Or the team itself just didn't feel right anymore. And you go to a new area and they rediscover their, their, their uh, previous play. And that's what the Yankees are bidding on uh, for Rudnett Odor. Paying him, you know, I think they're only paying him like $2 million out of the rest of the salary. The Rangers are paying him almost 95% of the salary that Odor's get, uh, making. So what, what is it to lose? And if he figures it out, great. If he doesn't figure it out, you release him, you don't pay, you, you don't owe him anything at that point. So it's a, it's a typical Yankee move uh, that they made. And like you said, it, it created a little bit of buzz on, uh, adding a piece of that roster that can help a little bit with the depth side of it, uh, can help a little bit in, in the lineup. Uh, when you do have the injuries that that pop up from Stan and Judge or uh, Frazier at some point or Sanchez with these guys, just, you know, you've got to have a little bit of a pop in the bat. And Odor uh, being a, one of the better second baseman hitters uh, over the last you know, few years prior to, uh, prior to last year in 2019, uh, he can if he can get back to it, the Yankees are going to get a good steal out of that one uh, from the Rangers. Yeah, I agree, and I also feel like his style suits Yankee Stadium. I think that might help his numbers as well. Yeah, uh, the new new ballparks, and as I think, it's you know playing in a launching pad in Texas. Uh, and then you go to the Bronx, uh, go to the Bronx Stadium, where it's three fifteen down the line, and and. Uh, right field at 310 down the line, actually it's a small Cracker Jack ballpark. Uh, so it can be a little bit of a, a little bit more beneficial to get some more power numbers for Odor uh, out of him. So you go from a launching pad to another launching pad and, you know, hitters love those ballparks and uh, they're going to, if he can figure it out, like I said, the uh, Yankees are going to be very happy. They got to steal out of that with Odor. Yeah, I agree. Um, that just about finishes up the show. Is there any other thoughts? you've got from the offense around the league this point? Like I said, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what the uh, the individual races of uh, MVP and, and Cy Young is going to look like. As I said, my prediction, I, I think at the moment right now, Ronald Acuna Jr. Uh, is putting himself in position to be a good MVP candidate. I uh, had an early preseason prediction that Vladimir Guerrero Jr. would be a good candidate for the American League MVP discussion uh, coming in camp in better, uh, good shape. Uh, this year as well as a lot of young talent that's trying to submit themselves into those conversations uh, this year. Uh, so it's going to be very interesting to see uh, the individual races throughout the season, uh, the accomplishments that those guys uh, can make, uh, uh, make throughout. And it's going to be, it's going to be a fun. I'm, I'm like I said, I'm excited about how this season can turn out and, and watching these guys, uh, these young, the new generation start taking control of, uh, of, of the outcome of baseball moving forward. Yeah, I'd rate and I'm excited to see what uh, plays out this week and what we'll be talking about this time next week. Absolutely. I know one thing about this uh, from especially last night, Sunday Night Baseball, uh, the, uh, you were talking about the Phillies and Braves. We had the controversy at home play with the replay uh, call and uh, hopefully Major League Baseball can kind of resolve some, uh, some of their replay issues. I know they've had a little bit of bad history uh, with replays um, here and there throughout a couple of seasons. So if Major League Baseball kind of resolve some of those issues and, and kind of get some things, make sure the replays are supposed to be correct. Um, if you have some bad calls made, they need to be correct. And right now it's uh, uh, from a handful over the last two years, for sure, they've been uh, kind of slipping on that side of it. So, you know, that's something that a lot of people this week are going to be talking about at the same time watching these, um, these challenges and replay officials uh, moving forward, if the calls can stay correct and it can be made correct uh, by, based off of those replay uh, calls. Agreed. And um, let's hope that gets a swift resolution. Um, other than that, uh, I'd like to thank you for joining me um, today. And um, I wish you good luck for your games next weekend. Appreciate it, Dan. It's always a pleasure. Uh, always a lot of fun uh, doing these shows lately. Yeah. So, and uh, thank you to everyone for listening. And until next time, let's talk sport fans. <laughs>